And yeah, there we go. I almost feel like uh, I don't have to have this because I haven't been here last week, and so I didn't really talk or shout at anyone. I had no kids to yell at, so I don't really feel like I need a microphone. But hey, we'll make it easier for everyone. But uh, hey, so I want to tell you a little update on the Bless Every Home. Uh, we have been working on this week um, some little square cards that will fill in your wallet that just is our inviter card. So like this was kind of helpful for us to send out to people who have moved to the neighborhood. And we're still doing that. We're sending that in the mail. But as something to have when you go knock the door, um, it's just an inviter card. It makes you kind of like, hey, I actually am from a church. You know, I'm not just random knocking on the door. But uh, what they uh, have found to be the most effective when you do go knock on someone's door and introduce yourself, is actually a handwritten note, like on a post-it note or on a random piece of paper, just a note uh, that is personal, it's short, and it's from you, you know, and it's not something that's been corporate, duplicated, and you've been made to take. It's a personal, personal invite. Um, so this last week, uh, did anyone get the opportunity to have any interaction with neighbors or family or colleagues? Got no over here. No. First week you didn't interact with someone. Yeah. Um, we have um, like uh, neighbors that are not being um, covered by people who have signed up to be lights, because we get about 30 to 50 every week sent to us as a church, but not everyone who signed up to be a light lives in those neighborhoods that we've been, that people have moved to. Um, so if you would like to, you can tell me today, and uh, I will send you just one a week if you want that's not been covered, and you could just go to that address and say, hey, I'm from a church local, heard that you moved Here's one of our cool cards. Love to hear about your story and just get to meet them. Um, if you'd like to do that, let me know afterwards and we will make that happen for you. But uh, I want to do something a little bit uh, different today. I want to read a Bible verse. It's appropriate for church on a Wednesday night. Um, Romans chapter 12, um, verse 9 through 13. It says, this is about marks of a true Christian. Are you a true Christian? That's the question today. Uh, this is some of the ways you could tell if you are a true Christian. Uh, let love be genuine, or another version says, uh, let love be sincere. Um, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. So like it starts talking about how we should treat each other as believers, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And it's just like weird thing. Um, who uh, remembers Pastor Alan McBrayer? Okay, some of your yeah, he's awesome. And he taught me some really cool things when he was here. And one of those things was that when hospitality is mentioned in Scripture, almost every single time it's related to non-believers. It's to, or to strangers, actually. Not non-believers, but to strangers. And so the idea isn't only... Um, you know, food and accommodation. Uh, but being hospitable to a stranger is showing love and showing care and going the extra mile to someone who you do not yet know. And so like the marks of a true Christian, you know, so often we think about that in the way that we treat each other here at the church and, and other believers. But there's definitely something that God, um, that God has set for us to do that is uh, in how we show love for people we do not yet know. And um, so just it was an encouragement to me when I was reading that, a reminder, thanks Pastor Allen, if you're watching online, um, that that's what we're doing. When we knock these doors, 
um, these are strangers. It's, an, it's a hospitable thing to do. It's the mark of a true Christian to make the effort to meet people that are estranged to us. And so that's all I have today. We're going to, we only got this week and next week and we're coming to an end. Um, but definitely let me know today if you want me to uh, start sending you one door a week to go knock somewhere close to the church and I would love to do that. Uh, but I'm going to pray, Michael, and then I'll hand over to you. Uh, Father, I thank you for the chance that we get to uh, do our, our part in trying to show love to strangers and to be hospitable to our literal neighbors and to begin to figure out what it looks like to be the odd one, the weird ones that knock on doors and introduce ourselves in a culture that has become uh, abnormal to do that. And um, with our friends and our colleagues and our family members, the people that we uh, interact with at random in our days, Lord, I pray that you continue to give us the courage and um, just help us to not just be in a hurry and a rush all the time uh, to where we, we don't stop and take a moment to ask someone if they know you. And uh, Lord, I pray that the uh, session that we uh, watch today will uh, teach us and inspire us and equip us to, to do what Romans 12 uh, is talking about. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Oh, goodness. Let's see. So can we make that like, like a requirement for the class? Everybody gets a, a name once a week? So, so one of the things that, because um, Chris had actually sent me one, this was a couple of weeks ago and I still haven't gone to the door because I keep telling myself I'm too busy. So I think if you put me on the list, like I think holding me accountable would be great. And then if I don't do one that week, send me another one. And then I got two to do. Something like that. To like keep, keep the accountability going. I think it'd be good for all of us just to, to attempt it. Uh, maybe just send all of us one uh, this coming week and we see how it goes. And then if you don't want to do it after that, that's okay. But at least it gives us that one step to go and, and attempt it. I think that'd be great. Yeah, we, we could do that as well. Go on a pair. Chris or I could go with you or however we want to do it. We could make that work. Um, but I think that would be a good thing to do because I think that's, that's what it's going to take for us is to kind of hold each other accountable with, with actually going and doing it. Um, I'm not going to be up here for long. There's just one verse I wanted to read really fast and then I'm going to show you a video and um, I want you to keep this verse in mind as you watch this video. Uh, the verse is actually also in Romans, uh, but this is Romans 2.15 or starts in verse 14 actually. For when the Gentiles do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternate, alternately accusing or else defending them. So just keep that verse in mind as we watch this video, and then we'll, we'll go from there. I, I stopped at that point because um, he kind of goes on about the men issue. So Ray Comfort goes, approaches like his evangelism totally different than I do. Like I don't think I could have ever attempted to even reach that kid because I would have started throwing information and evidence and stuff like that at him and that's not what he needed. And you could tell that the gospel pierced right through his heart just by watching it. You could see the conviction and the guilt and, and, and all that stirring up in him as you're watching the video. And so this session is going to, explain to us why that happens, why that works. Why is it that, um, that there's something inwardly that we all know about reality? And we can use that when we're having conversations with people because inwardly we know that the world is broken and we know that we're broken. And so I think we can use that and pull it out of them and then give them the good news, the solution to that. So that's all I'm gonna say on that. We can go ahead and start the session because it's kind of getting a little later and then we'll talk after. <laughs>
I don't really know how I can put that any better. <laughs> um, I used to think that the argument, because it's basically called the argument for desire. I used to think it was a kind of a weak argument because it wasn't really based on any evidence and there was no real case to build. It was just kind of assumptions that we have this desire within us. But I think the more that I've learned about it and the more I've, I've come to understand it, it's a really powerful argument because it's something that we all know even though we don't say we do. Even though they may say that they're atheists, they know inwardly that there's something, there's something wrong. They know that there are things that are absolutely wrong regardless of how they want to try to lay out their reasoning behind it. Whenever I was having the conversation with my neighbor, I remember going over the moral argument and I asked him what is objectively or where, what is his objective standard for things being wrong? And he said, well, it's because it's hurting another person. And I said, okay, why is that wrong? And he said, because I wouldn't want to be hurt. And I said, okay, why is it wrong for you to be hurt? And he said, because it hurts humans, it hurts the human nature. And I said, but why is that wrong? And he said, I don't see where you're going with this. He couldn't see that there was a standard he was appealing to that he didn't even know about. And I think this is what we experience when we talk to people. They are so separated from God and they've built these worldviews kind of like the kid. The kid didn't even really know what he believed in that video, right? He was confused throughout the whole questioning. And I think that's what's going on in the world is people are confused. They're building these worldviews because it's what they think sounds good or what they think um, they want to believe. But we can appeal to that desire, that hole that they're trying to fill um, and, and draw that out. And I think it's, it's a very powerful argument to use and it's something that we need, to, we need to use. We need to be mindful of that when we're having conversations with people um, because we all know that that desire was there. I knew that there was something in me as an atheist that was, that was missing. It was almost like a hole that needed to be filled and you start trying to fill it with all this stuff and it's stuff that never satisfies you. That's why you have people making tons of money but there's still something missing. They always have to have something more. There's always something, the next step or the next thing to get to try to fill that hole that's in them. But there's a, a, on one of the podcasts that I listened to by William Lane Craig, he told a story that I thought was really interesting. He said that there was a, um, this was a missionary that he had, he was friends with. He said the missionary went to a retirement home on Valentine's Day to pass out roses to all the, the elderly women in the retirement home. And he was passing them out and he noticed that there was one woman in a wheelchair that was blind, could hardly hear. She, her face was kind of deformed and she looked really bad. She was basically just sitting there. And he walked up to her and he handed her this rose and he said, here, I want you to have this. And she smelled it and she said, that smells nice, but I don't need it. Could you give it to someone else, please? And he said, but it, it's for you. This is a rose for you. She said, but I, I'm happy. There's, there's no reason for me to need it. You can, let's take it to someone else. So he wheeled her over and they gave it to someone else. And he asked, well, why did you do that? And she said, because I have everything I need. All I have is Jesus. And he sat there and he said, well, what do you mean? She said, I think on Jesus. I sit here and he said, well, how do you think on Jesus? Because he's, he's basically asking her, what are you doing while you're in the retirement home? You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. How are you just okay and content? And she said, because I have Jesus. She said, I think on Jesus. He said, could you tell me how you do that? Because I have trouble thinking on Jesus for more than five minutes. And yet this lady is completely satisfied. She has nothing. She literally has nothing in, in this world but yet she's completely satisfied because she ponders on Jesus. I think that's what heaven is gonna be like. It's gonna be experiencing Jesus in a way that we could never imagine here. And I think with all these distractions, we tend to focus on those distractions rather than thinking on Jesus and relying on him and just meditating on him because we're, there's so much going on. So even though 
looking at her out from the outside, it seemed like everything was missing in her life and she was having a terrible life in this retirement home. But on the inside, she had everything she needed. I thought that was a super powerful story. Um, we have a little bit of time if you guys have any questions or anything on that topic. We've got the question square block. Oh, he, he's got it. Good. Okay, cool. I was, I was gonna circle back to what you said about your conversation with, with your neighbor. How did, how did that wrap up when you were going back and forth about the, the central idea of why is it, you know, where are you going with this? Why is it wrong to hurt people? How did, how did that conversation end? Where did, where did it go next? So when I, I, I kind of pointed out the issue. I said, there's an objective standard you're appealing to that you don't realize that you're appealing to it. And I said, this is the argument for morality. This is, is what we mean by the argument for morality, that we know, all know that there's an objective standard by which we're measuring what is good and what is evil. Um, and I remember he told me, he said, well, that's not a very powerful argument because there's no evidence for that. <laughs> and I said, you're right. I said, there is, there is no actual evidence I could point to for that. This is just something that you know. And I said, but can you tell me anyone who believes otherwise? And he said, no. And I said, there's your evidence. Now, whether he took that or not, I don't know. But like I said, originally I, I thought these arguments weren't, weren't compelling, but I think they are. I think we just have to draw them out and show them that they're not living in the way that they believe in their belief system. They're living contrary to what their belief system says. And that's why I say when I talk about Christianity, it's, it is the best explanation for why things are the way that they are. This best explains the, the existence of evil. And not only does it explain the existence of evil, but it gives the only solution. When you look at any other worldview, there's no solution to the problem. It gives the solution to the problem, and that's Jesus. I think if we took the gospel at its word, we would realize that we don't need any other extenuating <clears throat> information to go out and evangelize mm -hmm. and bring people to the knowledge of the truth. Because the gospel itself attests to the fact that as far as a saving knowledge of faith, the gospel is all that is needed it separates spirit and truth, separates joint and marrow. All scripture is God breathed and is um, usable for all these different things. Um, teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. So, you know, I think that if we could get out there just equipped with the gospel and the faith that the gospel that Christ commands us to have in his word and his word alone that the spirit is going to do the spirit's work and that we just boldly go out like like Paul said I came preaching nothing else but Christ and him crucified didn't come with any sort of trick or method, just came boldly proclaiming Christ and him crucified. And I feel like, especially after the Enlightenment era, um, we have become quite timid in regards to the power that Christ says that his word has. Um, so. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the reasons why we become so timid is I think that a lot of times with the distractions that we uh, have in the world, I think they tend to pull us away from the impact of the gospel, right? 
not only the impact of what the gospel message is, but the fact that this is actually all real. Like this is actually true. This isn't something that we're believing because we were brought up that way. This isn't something we're believing because we have this, this blind faith. Like there, this is actually true. And that's one of the reasons why I love apologetics as much as I do, because not only is it great to have, to give that defense, but it also reassures to me that this is all actually real. Mm -hmm. And then when you come at someone that really understands it mm -hmm. and really gets the gospel message, it's that much more powerful mm -hmm. to pierce their heart. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it, 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 even some Christians in the church, I don't think really have a proper grasp on just how impactful this is. I think some people have, have grown up and have heard it over and over and over and over so many times that it's kind of lost its impact. If you hear the gospel message like we did today and you don't tear up, you need to revisit it because this is the most important thing in our reality that we need to focus on. Jesus is the most important thing that we need to focus on and it's so easy to be distracted from it. It, it really is. But I think that's why it's important for us to continuously revisit the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the actions and the suffering of Christ. Um, that's why I love how we do communion the once a year, but we also need to remember it every day, every day before we go out and let it impact us the way that it originally did when we gave our life to Christ because that's how it should impact us. It's something that we don't deserve and it's something that we have to also keep in mind when we're out there, every person that you interact with that's not a believer, you've gotta think how empty their life must be. Because I can remember my life prior to Christ and just how empty, I had nothing to really rely on. And so I think it's important if we keep that in mind when we're having conversations with people, knowing that they are lost, they are separated from God, and you know the good news. You know the solution, you know the answer. So how unloving of, it, of us is it for us not to go out and tell them the solution to that longing that they have in their heart? Tell them that not only are you separated from God, but he's provided a way for you to have a right relationship with him again. And this is what he did. And then you use the gospel and when you're having conversations with people that have grown up in a church and ended up leaving it, they've heard that same message over and over again, but it never really pierced their heart. And that's why, again, why I enjoy apologetics because I can use apologetics, I can use the reasons for why it's actually true so that when I revisit the gospel with them, it really pierces their heart and it really, they actually may hear it for the first time and not just this made up story that they think they've grown up with. Anyone else? No? Um, that's all I had today. There is something, because we have one more session next week, and I think what I'm gonna do, because I, I wanna start doing this as well, because I've noticed like, when I'm out having conversations with people, there are times that I feel like I need to either follow up with them or leave them with something to really think about and usually what I'll do is I'll tell them to go and read the Gospel of John to, to really understand the purpose of why Jesus came. But I think one of the things I wanna start doing and by next class, I'm gonna bring you, all, you guys all um, two or three little pocket Bibles and I want you to always have one on you. Like this is your, um, this is something you won't leave your house without. It will allow you that when you're having a conversation with someone and you have trouble bringing up a verse, it'll allow you to, to be directed to that verse. It will also allow you that when you're having um, a conversation about the gospel with them, you let them read what Jesus says out loud rather than you just telling them. There's something about reading the word that's more impactful than you just telling it to someone. And then it also gives you something to leave with them. That's why I say I give you a couple and when you Get, when someone takes that one, you go on Amazon and buy another pocket Bible or you have maybe a stack of them at home and always have them with you so that we can use those when we're having conversations with people. Um, but I think that's, it's just something that'll 
It'll help remind us because it'll always be with us and something that we can leave with them. So I'm gonna pray for us and then we can head out. Father, I thank you for this class and um, these, these group of people who've continuously came and um, we want to, to share your word. We want to share the good news with the world and I pray that um, you, you would allow your Holy Spirit to just take over in our lives, put people in front of us that we need to have conversations with and give us the right words to use and uh, the, the wisdom and the gentleness as we have those conversations. I pray that you always remind us um, just of your good news and what you've done for us. I pray that you help us to stay focused on that in a way that we're, we're not typically used to, a way that impacts us every day, um, every day that we walk in this life. Because uh, ultimately in this life, we are longing to be with you for eternity. I pray that you help us to remind us of that. And I pray that you help us stay focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen.